<laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. I'm excited to tell you today about a new area in the field of robotics, which is known as, as soft robots. And what I'm going to try to communicate in the talk today is about uh, what soft robots are, give some examples of, of research on these soft robots from my laboratory, and uh, as the title says, why they're for humanity, how they can help with our, our safety, our health, and our quality of life. So first of all, let me just do a little bit of an introduction to, to what soft robots are. Uh, this shows a kind of spectrum from mostly stiff robots that have a few compliant elements. Uh, the one on the left, possibly you've seen before, that comes from a Stanford uh, professor in my department, Mark Kokoski, who was one of the first to recognize that robots could take inspiration from animal biology and use some flexibility in their joints to improve their natural dynamics. And so he made robots that can run fast like cockroaches, whether or not that sounds good to you <laughs> may depend on how you feel about cockroaches. Uh, but nonetheless, it created some of the, the fastest small robots in the world that could be used for, uh, for surveillance and, and, and checking out unknown areas. All the way to the other end of the spectrum to something that was just published last year called the Octobot, which is entirely soft. So everything in it is soft. Even the, the circuitry of it is soft. And it's chemical reactions and fluids within the body of this soft robot that even um, controlling cause it to move. Uh, I think the challenge of some of these very, very soft robots is uh, they're sort of cool from a scientific perspective, but all this Octobot really does is kind of it, move a little bit. It doesn't really uh, do anything in the environment, and we don't really have a way for it to help people. And so um, along the spectrum of soft robots, I'm going to be showing you some examples of several projects from my lab, um, which have varying levels of softness, but are all designed to solve real-world problems uh, and, and affect humanity. And so these examples are as follows. The first one is going to be a, a hands-on simulator, uh, originally designed for medical simulation, but could also be used in other applications. And here it's about haptics. Haptics means the sense of touch, and we're trying to build devices that feel like real-world objects, even though they're artificial. And the second project is flexible medical robots that are designed to be just right to go through the body of a specific patient to be as minimally invasive as possible. And then the last one is about some new soft robots. These are very recent, just published for the first time this summer, about robots that effectively grow out of their tip and um, can grow like vines or plants and have some really interesting uh, properties and, and potential applications. And I'll also try to highlight for each of these some of the awesome students uh, that have contributed to these projects. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about this, this hands-on haptic simulation. And the reason why we would like haptic simulation in medicine is so that if someone is training to be a doctor, they can practice not on you, the patient, initially, but they can practice in some kind of virtual world. Now, there exist on the right-hand side these virtual environments that you can kind of poke at through a stick and get force feedback, and those can be very realistic but the interaction is limited to poking at something with a stick. On the other hand, you have on the left side these mannequins, which you can really get this hands-on training. If you want to learn how to palpate or do certain kinds of procedures, it's very natural. But these mannequins are static. We can't change the way that they feel for different pathologies. And so we're, we are, are missing something in between these two. And we'd like to have the best of both worlds. Another thing to consider when we're thinking about designing these haptic or touch feedback devices is that our sense of touch is really complicated. One way to, to simplify it or to think about it as two major categories is to say that we have force feedback devices. These are uh, devices that push on your arms or your hands, and you feel large-scale motions or forces in your body. Uh, and typically, these are done by poking through a stick. Uh, on the other hand, there's cutaneous or tactile devices which stimulate the skin. And this is often achieved through an array of little pins or other tiny motors or actuators that can provide distributed information on the skin. And it's this combination of what you feel in your skin and what you feel in your, in your muscles and tendons and your joints that all together give, up our, give our perception of the world around us and also of our, of our own bodies. 
And so ideally, you'd like the best of both worlds here. You'd like to have these immersive, realistic medical simulations. And uh, while there are many haptic devices that have been designed, there's this new concept of something called active surfaces. This is surfaces that can change their shape and mechanical properties. And we wanted to try to do this for medical simulation. So the idea is not to build an entire mannequin out of this stuff, because that's a lot of motors and it's very expensive, but that you have a little block of material that can change its shape and mechanical properties, but the user, the trainee, would see a visual display of a patient, like the one shown at right. And their hand is being used to palpate and look, for example, for a hard lump in soft tissue that might indicate cancer. And in this case, the user can reach out the hand the robot can move the block underneath the hand, and then the device can reconfigure itself to feel a certain way. And then if you want to touch a different part of the patient, it could move over there and reconfigure itself so it feels appropriately. So that's, that's the dream for how this all works together. I'm going to focus mostly on just the reconfigurable device itself and how this works. So this is an example of one of the very first devices that we built. It's a little four-cell array, and each cell can change both its shape and mechanical properties. In this case, we're trying to simulate what um, the surface of organs or the surface of the skin feels. So it's basically kind of a soft, lumpy environment, which matches well to the soft robotic technology that we have. And the way that it works is um, actually pretty simple. The way that it balloons up is by air pressure being applied from below. We can also uh, pin certain nodes in between these cells, and that can help pull it down and help us control shape. But the real sort of secret in this device is that to make things hard or soft, we have these silicone chambers that are filled with coffee grounds. So why coffee grounds? <laughs> so if you've been shopping at the grocery store and you buy vacuum-packed coffee grounds, you know that the package is really hard and stiff. But if you open up the bag and mix your finger around in it, of course, it's very soft and, and movable. So the vacuum is actually kind of locking the coffee grounds together and changing it from very soft to very stiff. So by vacuuming the air out of the chambers in the device, we can actually make it hard or soft. And there are many other smart materials that could be used, but coffee grounds were readily available in our research lab. And uh, the graduate students found that to actually be very effective material for doing this kind of jamming behavior. So in order to figure out, once we knew that this approach would work, we wanted to say, do, can we have a simulator that it would allow us to, to figure out how many cells we would need to create certain types of display? So we're able to say, if we have different shapes of cells and different combinations of them, can we come up with algorithms to create the shapes that we want? And we can test this all in a virtual environment before we build the devices. And that's important because building the devices is actually a huge pain. <laughs> uh, and this picture I show not to be proud of what a mess it is to actually build a large device with lots of cells in it, but to actually show that this is one of the main challenges of soft robotics right now in that if you want to have a bunch of chambers, each of which can be changing its mechanical properties and changing its shape, we need to be able to get beyond this kind of curse of dimensionality of all the different pneumatic lines and cables and, and actuators that are present. So uh, I always promised my PhD student I would show the slides. Everybody knows how hard he worked <laughs> to build this system. And uh, in, in the end, although it, it is a mess to build, you can actually have a very effective uh, system in the end. So the way might be turned down. Turn it off. Um, so this is a 100-cell array, which the, the, the guts of it were shown in the previous slide. And every one of the cells has these properties that I discussed earlier, where you can change the shape and the mechanical properties. And in this case, uh, for some reason, the conference we were submitting to wanted videos that, that all share the property of having a rubber ducky in it. So that is why it's going in the shape of a rubber duck. And uh, there could, could have been any shape. But the idea is that we, we measure it with one of these uh, 3D Connect cameras that you can get with your Microsoft PlayStation. We use that visual information and depth information for feedback, and then we control the device to be in that shape. And simultaneously, we can control it to be hard or soft in different locations. Ultimately, though, for creating any general shape, this is somewhat disappointing. We could actually do a pretty good job of recreating the abdomen and, and lumps and bumps in that area. 
But now if you want to think bigger about creating any shape, any mechanical property, this kind of 2 and a half D, uh, that is an XY plane that can go up and down, this kind of array of cells, isn't necessarily the optimal way to go. And you can see it doesn't really create a duck um, very faithfully, since duck is really 3D and not a 2 and a half D object. So the thing that we're working on now as we push forward with this project is really thinking about 3D shapes. So this is actually a heart model here. And the idea is that we can simulate hearts with different pathologies, an enlarged heart, a heart with muscle weakness, and so it has softness in certain areas. And then rather than trying to arbitrarily have some set array of, of, of cells that would require all of the complexity that I showed earlier, instead we can simplify this by saying we're going to have an algorithm where there's a few specific target shapes that we want to hit. And we want to design the optimal device to start with that can be morphed into those different target shapes and not any arbitrary shape. And that actually really simplifies the design, makes it more elegant, and actually makes it something that could be a commercial product. So this is something we actually collaborated with on, on a company to work on medical simulation. But I think this concept of, of objects that change their shape and mechanical property have a lot of other interesting applications. These include um, interesting human-computer interaction scenarios. So one example might be in consumer products. So let's say you wanted to buy a sneaker, and you wanted to get an idea of what its shape and size were other than just seeing it on a screen on your computer, or even in a VR environment where you're limited to visual interaction. So if you had such a device on your desktop, it could pop into the shape of that shoe. And then you might say, well, I don't like the shape of the toe box. I want to push it down, and I want to change its shape a bit. Well, that manipulation could then be recorded, sent back to the computer, even be sent back to the manufacturer who then might be able to create for you an ideal custom shoe that matches the way that, that you shaped it. So there are a lot of different concepts here for how this could be used, but the idea of a changeable project or digital clay I think is one of the, the dreams of, of engineering in general. And thinking at this from a perspective of, you know, what are the techniques and algorithms that you could use to make these changeable objects are going to start to get us there. At the moment, mechanically, practically, we can do this at the macro scale, but with new developments in MEMS and new actuation technologies and smart actuators in particular, there is the possibility to make something that's more like a truly changeable product a reality in the future. So that is one kind of soft robot, and it's a haptic or touch feedback device. I want to tell you now about a very different type of soft robot. It's not soft in the sort of stretchable sense um, of the silicone rubber that was used in the previous part, but it's soft in that it's flexible, and it's designed to go inside the human body. And the idea here is that you would like to get uh, deep inside a patient's body in the most minimally invasive way possible. Now, robot-assisted surgery is not science fiction. Many of you probably know that there are commercial surgical robots. Hundreds of thousands of procedures are done every year. Uh, prostate surgery is actually the biggest application right now for surgical robots because it allows clinicians to do the procedure in a minimally invasive fashion while, uh, while causing less damage to the body. And these surgical robots have actually had a lot of benefit but they also have a lot of cost. And then there are patient populations that the robot cannot be used with. Small children, the tools are a little bit too large. And then there are sometimes obese patients or people with other shapes of bodies that they just can't find the right path for these straight line tools to get inside the body where we want to go. And by the way, I'll promise you that there are no gory pictures in this, <laughs> in this talk. I, I have my gory picture talk, but I decided to leave it out for the alumni <laughs> event. So our idea here is that it's um, not about uh, just designing the, the, the big robot that can really precisely move the tool to a particular location, but rather thinking about it from a patient-centered uh, perspective. So what we want to do is have a patient-specific design workflow where you have images of the patient, for example, from a CT scan, you build a 3D model of the inside of that patient, and then there's um, a surgeon design process. The surgeon could actually design the shape of the robot they want that would snake through the patient's body in the most minimally invasive way possible to reach the target without puncturing through other organs. 
right? And then once the surgeon designs the robot that they want, they don't have to pick the motors or the bearings and the material, but they design the shape. And then we can fabricate it now using newer 3D printing technology that allows us to fabricate um, softer materials. And then we can actually drive it, attach it to a robot external to the body, and then drive this snake-like robot along the path that the surgeon designed it for. So there are many types of robots that can be used in surgery. And um, the specific type of robot that lends itself really, really well to this design methodology is called a concentric tube robot. And this was something developed um, quite a while ago, almost 10 years ago now, by a student of mine. And the way that it works is it uses a series of tubes, each tube being highly flexible. In this case, they're made out of nitinol, which is a super elastic material. And you put one tube inside the other, and you can put a third tube or a fourth tube or a fifth tube if you want. And you pre-curve those tubes. And so as they insert and spin with respect to each other, you can get this tentacle or snake-like behavior. And what that allows you to do is have a very thin kind of backbone to the robot and have all the motors and the parts that drive those tubes in and out and spin them keep those big motors outside the body. And that lets us have a really tiny instrument, which is very appropriate, for example, for the pediatric urologist here at Stanford that, that approached us about designing a new robot that got around the limitations of existing clinical robots. So this is not our, our doctor collaborator, but my graduate student, Tanya, um, using the 3D virtual reality environment where she's kind of immersed inside the patient's body, and she's designing the tubes. Uh, in fact, in this video, it's showing her designing the desired tubes outside the patient's body, and that's just because all of you really wouldn't be able to see what she was doing if she was really inside the virtual patient because you'd be you know, surrounded by all of these organs and such. So just for visualization purposes, uh, for you, she's designing it outside the body. And then once she designs the robot, she can simulate it, and she can say, okay, is the robot actually going to behave when it goes into the body in the way that I designed it for? And again, normally she would do this inside the virtual patient, so she could be testing it with respect to that patient's actual anatomy. And then we print it. So uh, I kind of made it sound like, you know, this hot new 3D printing technology is what's enabling this, and it is, but it's not like this is the most expensive, fancy 3D printer. We're doing this on a MakerBot. So those of you who have ever used a 3D printer have probably heard of MakerBots. They're on the cheaper end. They're about $3,000 for the highest end MakerBot. And one of the standard materials that they have is called PCL, and it's a biodegradable polyester. And this kind of material is actually already used in medical devices and even in sutures. Um, so, it turns out that making these robots out of PCL and printing it on a very standard cheap 3D printer is totally feasible and even relevant to actual clinical practice. So once you have your tubes, you print out the ones that the surgeon designed, and then you have to attach them to some motors that can insert and spin each tube in order to create this tentacle-like behavior. And uh, this as well doesn't have to use 3D printing, but we wanted to make this actuation system as small and lightweight and easy to move around the operating room as possible. So once again, we took advantage of 3D printing to make a really unique transmission system. We like to call it a waffle gear, where we really minimize the, su the size and shape of the transmission by having these sort of gears go over these waffle patterns in order to get the most degrees of freedom in the smallest amount of space. And this whole thing is made of plastic, so it can be very lightweight and handheld and cheap. And there's a couple pictures on the right showing different ways in which it can be held by a person or even held by another robot or a passive arm in order to be used in a medical procedure. So we put all of this together, all of these components of the actuation system, and we are looking for NIH funding in order to finish doing animal studies with this. But in the meantime, we have done this in an artificial patient. We took the same model from the CT scans we used to design the robot to then 3D print a patient and their artificial, uh, artificial tissues to represent them. And so we took that model, made an artificial patient, and then these clinical robots are currently not autonomous. Although uh, I live in Mountain View, there are self-driving cars all over my neighborhood, we are not ready for self-driving surgical robots because uh, although the self-driving car problem is very, very difficult, there are rules of the road, 
vision is not as occluded as it is inside the body. The, bo inside the body is very messy, there's manipulation of tissues, and, and the response is not well understood. So the human has to be in the loop to drive this robot. It's not operating by itself. So the same surgeon who designed the robot has an idea not only of the shape they wanted to follow, but, but how it should move along that path. And so that same surgeon can then use this master robot, which actually is a haptic device, uh, in order to command the positions and orientations of, of the robot inside the body. So kind of full circle, the same surgeon that designed the robot can then teleoperate it in order to control its movement inside the patient. And we've demonstrated this, um, showing that uh, in our artificial patient, we can go around ribs, we can go in at angles, that would be less invasive to a patient. For example, this represents an eight-year-old with a kidney stone. And with eight-year-olds, the size of their body is such that there's no straight line path to get to the kidney stone with a needle. And so instead, we, we curve around the ribs, avoid the lungs in order to get to that target. And we've shown that we can do that in these artificial tissues. So again, it's a, it's a soft robot, and the softness that is the flexibility of the plastic in these tubes enables it to have the kind of movement capabilities that it does, but it's a very different kind of softness from the first case, where we're not really changing its stiffness, and we're not really fully changing its, its shape by blowing it up, but rather the interaction of the, tissue, of, the, the, of the tubes causes different types of bending to change the shape. The third project is kind of a, a mix of those two previous soft robots. Um, it's like the first one in that it uses pneumatics, it uses air pressure to run, but it's also like the second project in that it makes a, a long, skinny tool and it might have applications in medicine. And this project we like to think of as, as a robot growth that's biologically inspired. And the idea is that there are many things in nature which, which grow, ranging from very small things like pollen tubes to vines, which if you're a gardener may be the bane of your existence. But for us, vines are really cool because they can climb along walls, they can get through small crevices, and they're able to do that because unlike animals which have to move their whole body, they just extend from the tip, and that tip can actually be quite tiny. So the way that we achieve this, this growth, it's not magical. We're not magically creating material at the tip. But what we are doing is we're feeding more plastic through the center of a plastic tubing. And if you're having trouble picturing mechanically how this works, if you've ever seen one of those water snake toys, they're kind of like a torus that is elongated and they flip in and out of each other. My kids have, have them. They, they love them. <laughs> Fun toys. But now instead of thinking of it as constantly rotating about itself, we just keep feeding more material through the center, and that allows it to grow, as shown in there. Now, what this allows is extremely large change in length. So unlike a, a classic snake robot where the whole snake has to move its body, we just keep growing like a plant does. And so, let me see if I can get these videos to play. So the video on the top right shows one just growing vertically against gravity until eventually it buckles and falls over. The ones on the bottom show a whole roll of this tubing that keeps getting fed out. And the right bottom video shows the end result from having just pressurized and fed this tube through. And this is just a couple PSI. I think we grew this about 70 meters. Our, our goal had been to grow at the length of the Stanford football field, and we, we pretty much got there. Uh, we only ran out of plastic. That was, I think, our, our limited issue. Uh, although it turns out you can get really big balls of these plastic, uh, really big tubes of them um, from, uh, from Amazon. So we now have a good plastic supply, and we'll never be troubled by that again. Uh, and so the cool thing is that we can grow at very, very long distances. But you might say that this is not this is not a robot yet. It might be soft, but it's not a robot. It becomes a robot when we can actively control it. We can tell it to turn left and turn right. And so to do that, we need to have a way that it's not like putting motors and joints like with a classic robot. We have to find a way that, that at the tip it can change its mind about which direction to go. And there are two ways to think about doing that. One is a way that's permanent. And in the permanent method, we have pinches on the plastic. When you pinch the plastic on one side, it curves towards the pinch. And if we let that pinch peel off, we let it unpinch, then it will go straight. 
So we can have this permanent direction change just by letting pinches unpinch when we want it to go straight. On the right hand side is something that's a little more compl complicated but more flexible and that is reversible direction change where we have multiple kind of pneumatic tendons, um, one of which is shown in the video on the right right now, and then we put those around the outside of the backbone of the growing robot and those can be controlled in a reversible fashion. You can look left, you can look right, and then you can decide where to grow. And we've done this uh, with overhead cameras as well as on the right, having a camera that stays mounted at the tip of the growing robot. And that way you can always look at where you're going and uh, although in some applications like medical, there might be other applications where having an autonomous robot is useful. So we've shown that the, based on the camera images, we can autonomously grow to targets. And those are non-reversible methods in that video. This set of video is the same thing, but with the reversible methods. We're growing towards uh, a light using a camera mounted on the tip. And you can start to imagine now the applications where this would be, where this would be useful. So I'll give you some examples of these applications. This is like our robot gym <laughs> showing all of, some of, the, all of the different uh, uh, actuation uh, technologies, some of them just growing, some turning, and it being able to do several interesting tasks. So the top left, it's popping through a very small hole, much smaller than its own body diameter. The middle one shows the robot going through a kind of obstacle course of going through a bath of glue and then getting punctured by some nails and it just keeps going as it feeds more material through. On the right along the top is a firefighting robot which actually grows over the fire and then the fire melts the plastic and then the water inside the robot puts the fire out. Cute, huh? We like that one. And then uh, the bottom one is actually really exciting because it starts to show some very simple manipulation capabilities of such a robot. So here we grew it under a door. We pre-mechanically programmed it through this non-reversible direction change to grow up and around and hook around a lever which it could turn, for example, to turn off a gas leak or something like that. So you can imagine a, a search and rescue or disaster scenario. You could get into places where people don't want to go and then do some kind of manipulation task. So this is a very new kind of soft robot and it's just taking advantage of the flexibility of that plastic material and the pneumatic pressure to achieve these interesting behaviors. So I hope that gives you a good introduction to the kinds of things that we can do with soft robots which are very different from the traditional industry, industrial robots or even medical robots that exist on the market today. And although there is, is very few things happening commercially right now with soft robotics, I think over the next decade, you'll, you'll start to see an explosion of, of products and new research in this interesting area. And I'll end by thanking you for listening and all of my awesome students that contributed to this work. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.